Hey everybody, welcome back. So today I want to show you this generator that I just bought. So it is a Briggs & Stratton Elite Series generator. Just looking around, I believe it's a 10,000 running, run, yeah, 10, running watt, 12,500 starting watt generator. Now, if you've been watching my other videos, you, you know that I have quite a few generators. In fact, you could see a couple of them off over on the right, yeah. So you may be asking yourself, why did I buy yet another one? Well, there's a good reason. One, it was fairly inexpensive. This one I paid uh, $850 for. It included the generator, uh, four air filters, five oil filters, four gas cans, and a lot, a lot of generator cable, which you can kind of see sitting on the couch over there. That's probably 50 feet of generator cord. That, that cord alone is probably two, 300 bucks. But anyway, that aside, why did I decide to buy a new generator when I have so many? Great question. So. If you look at my prior videos uh, about my portable generators, I'll leave a link in the description, you'll notice that a lot of them have a lot of what you call harmonic distortion, right? So that measures how much a waveform differs from its, um, sorry guys, it's been a long day. The word is escaping me. But anyway, for a generator, it's going to be how much the waveform differs from a 60 hertz sine wave, right? So if you recall from those videos, I'll see if I can find some screenshots. They, they, you know, they were kind of sawtooth jagged. They weren't really all that pretty. So this generator, I asked the seller to take a picture of the jet label on the generator head for me, and I'll show you what I saw. There is the label on the generator head, and notice these words like right down there. Low distortion. So while I am not familiar with the Synchro brand, they may be great, they may be horrible, I just don't know. This appears to be a low distortion generator head. So what does that mean? That means it's safe for use on electronic, uh, you know, sensitive electronics, uh, AC induction motors, air conditioners, the whole nine yards. Anything that's sensitive to an uh, uh, impure or, um, sorry guys, it's been a really long day. Um, a distorted AC waveform, this generator should be safe, but we'll test that. Now, aside from the price, Aside from the low distortion generator head and aside from its obviously decent condition, why else did I buy it? Bought it because of that. This has a Briggs & Stratton Vanguard engine. Now, again, if you watch some of my prior videos, I'm generally not too polite when it comes to Briggs & Stratton engines. I've had a lot of problems with them over the years. However, this one, this one is not actually a Briggs & Stratton. This one is made, I believe, by Daihatsu. Uh, I believe a Japanese company uh, as part of a joint venture that goes all the way back to the 90s. So this one's actually a true commercial grade engine, not like a Briggs IC or a Briggs EdTech IC, a Briggs Commercial, a Briggs Commercial Turf. I mean, it, in my opinion, my personal opinion, they're all garbage. This is a true commercial engine. Some of the features I like about this engine, which is supposedly good for you know over 2,000 hours of our of operation. Uh, you can kind of see it to the left of the muffler over here. It's got an oil filter, so it's got full pressure lubrication. I mentioned the seller included a bunch of these, but it's got a nice automotive style paper air cleaner. It's got cast iron cylinder liners. It's a V-twin engine design, low oil shutdown, or it's, he's got an oil pressure sensor. I saw it on the bottom of the oil filter, oil filter housing. Um, so yeah, this is a, this is a, this was a pretty sweet deal. That engine alone, it would to buy it new today is probably about somewhere between 1500 and 1800 bucks just for the engine. So to buy this whole generator today, like if you were to buy a comparable one from Northern Tools, you're looking probably $3,200. So I'm pretty happy getting this for 850, especially with all the accessories. Give you a quick walk around. Forget the shakiness, I am freehanding it here. So the seller indicated he bought this new right after Hurricane Wilma, which is probably 2005 or so. Never really had to use it, but he did start it, I think he said once a year, just to make sure it ran. He just put a new battery in there so the battery works. I brought my fluke meter and just did a basic test before I actually paid for it. Oh, and the model number is uh, down here somewhere. That's a, on that label. 09801-09. You will notice this generator is not terribly big on 120 volt uh, NEMA 
515T plugs or 520T plugs. Uh, the reason for that is it's designed to be plugged into a house. So on the right, you see a 240 volt 50 amp plug like you'd see for a welder. I believe that's a NEMA 6-50P. So if you want this thing to power your house, that's probably be the plug that you would use. Um, it does also have uh, idle control. So what does that mean? So if this generator doesn't detect a load on the output side, it will actually throttle down the motor to a fast idle to save fuel and also reduce the noise, which is quite nice. Uh, what else does it have? Uh, it has a 12 volt battery charger on the left down, down there. So you got your ignition switch, your idle uh, automatic low, um, idle control switch, and you have your accessory plugs with breakers and whatnot. That's probably enough yapping. So now the next step is I want to measure that, or not measure, at least I want to eyeball that harmonic distortion of that generator head. So I don't have the fancy equipment to actually give me a, a number. Total harmonic distortion usually expresses a percentage. Uh, can usually eyeball the curve and get a general idea of how good it is. So again, previous videos, you saw me do a waveform of some portable generators. Uh, I believe the worst one in the punch was this one right here, a Coleman Powermate. Somewhere in the middle was this, one, this Black Max. And uh, slightly better than the Black Max, I think, was another Briggs & Stratton generator. Obviously, the best of the bunch was an inverter generator because they take um, AC power, they generate AC power, uh, rectify it into DC, and then reinvert it into pure AC. So that's going to be the best. That's going to be closest to utility power. But again, that inverter generator only does 2,000 watts. This one does 10. So that said, uh, let's plug this thing into the oscilloscope and just take a visual look at the waveform and see how good it really looks. After we do that, I'm just going to do a basic tune-up on the engine. Uh, I'm going to kind of just look everything over, change the oil. I'm going to switch to uh, Mobile 115W50, which is what Briggs & Stratton recommends on these vanguards in a high heat environment like South Florida. Um, but yeah, let's hook up to the scope first. It's a couple days later, just really haven't had the time to, to do this, but got the generator all hooked up, moved over in the corner here. I have it hooked up with a what they call a suicide cord, which is a 120 volt plug going into the generator. The other end of it's going up to my oscilloscope over here. So I have the probe to the hot wire and the other wire to the neutral. Don't do this unless you know what you're doing. Please, 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 please. This is very dangerous, but um, I'm doing this for you guys. So we're gonna get the generator going and then we're gonna look at the waveform on the scope. We'll take some captures and I'll include that in the video so you guys can see how nice it is or how not nice it is. Turn the fuel on. Fuel is on. Make sure the ignition is on the back. Ignition is in the run position. And pull the choke. And we'll press the button. couple shots you'll see are unloaded. Uh, the next uh, shot that you'll see is with the generator loaded with a 1500 watt heat gun. So let's queue up those photos. Well, maybe not. Maybe we'll just talk through them. I don't know. Anyway, the next step in this is uh, probably dumping the oil. I did see a little bit of a hiccup in the waveform, so I think I might go through and uh, maybe turn the fan off first.
Yeah. So I might go and check the capacitors in the generator head just to make sure that they are in good condition uh, because they do go bad over time and with use. I did buy some spare capacitors. If I have to, I'll install those. But first, let's dump the oil. Here's a little trick you may or may not know about. So in a lot of these drain plugs, you have a little square square uh, plug that keeps the oil in, right? The drain plug. You might be tempted to stick a crescent wrench on there. You can, but what you can also do is take a 3 8 or half inch extension, stick it on the drain plug, and turn it that way too. After I get out of the way, nine times out of ten this will work too. And it's working here. Keep your fingers out of the harm's way. This oil looks brand new, which kind of is supported by the seller's claims that he just changed the oil. But I want to put a different viscosity in there. There's a little bit of glitter in there too. Let that drain for a little bit. Do have to give Briggs and Stratton some credit here. They made it pretty easy and relatively painless to change the oil here. Not a very messy process either. Just stick a drain pin under it, remove the plug. Pass the point of diminishing returns here. So let's put our drain plug back in. Once again, I'm just gonna use that uh, half inch socket extension, the drain plug in there like so. Hopefully not spill it in the oil. There we go. We'll just snug it up. All done. We'll clean the generator frame and then uh, we'll move on to the oil filter. And things are going to be significantly more uncomfortable over by the muffler if you remove the oil filter after the generator has run. It's going to be quite hot. So I'm going to use a 74 millimeter. 14 flute oil filter wrench to remove the filter and keep my hands out of the way. Like so. We'll let that oil drain for a minute. Now because I have a a lot of these filters that the seller gave me, I'm going to continue to use the factory filter. You don't have to. You can choose your favorite filter brand if you'd like. I won't tell. Okay. Filter is removed. Let that drip dry for a moment. Okay, I got my new filter. Pre-fill it with some 1550 Mobile One. While the pan's still here, because this is undoubtedly going to make a mess. This seems to be the, the oil of choice for outdoor power equipment in Florida, anyway. It has a bit more zinc than your average mobile, than your average engine oil, and I believe even a lot of the other Mobile One oils. Don't know exactly why that is. It may have something to do with its multi application formula. I believe it's approved for use and actually even called for from the OEM in many cases for hydrostatic drives, for many other things. So this is kind of my universal oil. I use this on engines, hydrostatic drives, just about everything. I had pretty good luck with it. That's about as filled as it's gonna get without dumping out. So we'll screw that filter back on. That's our new filter. Just snug it up a little bit. I'm not going to crank down on it. That's good. 
Okay, now it's time to fill it back up with oil. Make sure you clean your funnel. Don't want to stick a dirty funnel into a clean engine. I even spray them out with carburetor cleaner sometimes just to make sure they are spotless because this oil goes right into the crankcase. Give mine a good spritz. Okay, nice and clean. Then we'll remove the oil filler cap and the valve cover there, the yellow cap that you see in the picture. Start dumping oil in it. It's always a good practice to make sure this cap can be removed before you drain all of the critical lubricating oil out of the generator. So now we've got our funnel. I believe it holds just under two quarts, if I remember correctly. Glug, 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 Stop and check your oil level often. Okay, I got the oil up to the full mark. Now we're going to put the oil filler cap back on and start the generator briefly just to fill the oil passageways and also the oil filter so we can get an accurate oil level. So I turn the idle control on and we're just going to start it up and let it run for a moment. And that should be plenty. We'll check the oil again and see what it looks like. Probably went down a little bit. I think it did. It's hard to tell. The oil's so clean. Can't really read it too easily on the dipstick. Yeah, it's about halfway between add and full, so I had a tiny bit more just to bring it up to the full mark again. Okay, oil level is now perfect. I'll let my funnel drain into a receptacle. Put the oil filler cap back on. And we'll move on to something else. The engine was running a little rough, so I'm debating whether or not I want to, I want to pull the carburetor off and clean it. I mean, it does run. I don't know. Maybe I'll decide that later. So as far as parts-wise, we have air filters that came with the unit. But uh, the air filter that's in there right now is so clean, I'm not going to bother messing with it. There is a pre-cleaner you're supposed to use on this, so I think we'll install this. It's pretty easy. Leave a link to the, the part in the description. Simply take the air cleaner housing off. Hopefully you guys can see. It's better. And pull the housing off. As you can see, the air cleaner looks pretty clean. We'll just put this pre-cleaner over the outside. These things will disintegrate in time. Sometimes I pre-oil them if uh, I know I'm gonna be in a dusty environment. I know for a fact this is not going to be in a dusty environment. This is just really belts and suspenders. You probably don't even need a pre-cleaner on this engine. Just uh, doing things by the book, right? Put your air cleaner back on. It's like one of those old automotive style filters from the I guess the 70s, 60s, and, and before. Okay, our air cleaner is on, secure. Put our air filter box back on. Sorry, I know my arm's in the way. Oh, 
Looks like I missed it. There we go. It wasn't on. Anyway. Now it's on. Another thing I like to do to outdoor power equipment when it doesn't already come with one of these is install an hour meter. That helps with service reminders. So this is currently my favorite hour meter. It's pretty straightforward. It has a built-in tachometer too. And you just mount it wherever you want. Don't mount it to the gas tank because you don't want to put holes in your gas tank. And you just wrap this wire around one of the spark plug wires like four or five times. And then it'll give you an engine RPM readout whenever you're uh, or it's running and it'll also give you the number of runtime hours. One thing I like about this hour meter, it has a replaceable battery. A lot of them don't have that, so it's kind of sealed for life type of thing. I think you do have to remove uh, something in the back that prevents the battery from draining in storage though. I'll take the cover off and take a look. It's been a little while since I've done one of these. So you just remove the cover with a Phillips head screwdriver here. Yeah, there's a little piece of plastic in there. Right there. So just yank that out. Put your battery cover back on. There you go. And now when you press these buttons, something should happen. Maybe not. Ah, right, you have to press and hold. S1 and S2 at the same time. There we go. There, there's our zero hour. So we'll wrap that around the number one spark plug wire. Here goes nothing. So I'm gonna do one, two, Make sure they're nice and tight. Three, the instructions say three to four, but I don't know, I feel like I usually do more than that. So the way that these things work is it'll count the number of ignitions. There we go. And we'll take our zip tie. We'll zip tie these two ends together. Nice and tight. And then I think I'm going to mount this thing on the other side because that's where the oil is and that's where the old dipstick is. Just a more logical location, I think. So let's just kind of route everything over here. This side, I think maybe I'll put it, what do you think, like maybe right here? Maybe I'll move it further back. Like over here. Yeah, I think I like that better. So let me, uh, let's route this cable out of the way because we don't want that getting caught on anything. Are there any holes we can tap into? There's a sheet metal screw, we can wrap it around that. Actually, even come back here, like under and behind the fuel line. Oh yeah, I think that'll work. Grab myself a couple self-tapping screws, stainless steel. I verified that the screw itself is not going to puncture the tank. I can stick the entire screw back here, and I have plenty of room. So, I think I'm going to mount it like maybe right about here. This way, it's easy to see. So we'll put one in, we'll level it, make it look good, and then we'll put the second one in. And if you ever need to change the battery, just take the screws out, it's good to go.
course, I don't know if the generator itself is level. Probably isn't. Actually, it is. Imagine that. It's going to bring this side up a little bit. Right about there. There we go. And we'll zip up the extra wire and just keep it out of the way. Keep it from rubbing on anything too. They do include two zip ties, which is kind of cool. There. There's your finished installation. And I'll crank it up again and let you guys see how that works. See, Mr. Hour Meter. Observe. I guess I should turn the ignition on, right? There we go. And when you shut it off, it reads the hours, and then it'll go blank briefly. Obviously, this hasn't been running for that long, so it still says 0, 0.0. I believe on this generator, the capacitors are under this black cover right here. So I'm going to take these screws off, loosen them. I think there's two on the other side as well that I'll loosen. Looks like I need to remove that, I don't know, maybe three, seven sixteenths bolt. Maybe it's three eighths, maybe it's seven sixteenths, maybe it's neither. Let's try three eighths. Nope. Seven sixteenths it is. Looks smaller than that. It is. I guess it's metric. Come on. Let's try a 10 millimeter. I forgot the generator head's from Italy. Maybe that's why it's metric. There we go. That's loose. Does the cover come off yet? Is there a screw on the back? No. So what's holding this thing on? Love? Well, I'll try taking the screws out. What do I got to lose, right? Um, when I'm looking for them, just remind me the screws are on top of the gas tank. There's two on the other side, and this little bolt here. I think I may have said this before. If not, I'm repeating myself, but if you, even if these capacitors don't need to be replaced, it's good to have these spare parts around, because you might need them one day. If those capacitors die while you want to use your generator, guess what? Generator is not going to work. There we go. And the, here, here are our capacitors right here. Let's see if I can get you guys in there for a better shot. Let's 
scoot over to this side. I had this wonderful monologue recorded, and you know what? I realized that I, the camera wasn't on record, so I guess I didn't record it. Anyway, so I took this cover off, and under there, there are two capacitors. There's a 30 microfarad capacitor right there, plus or minus five. And here is a 25 microfarad capacitor, plus or minus five. But they look just like each other. I mean, the other one just 30 instead of 25. Uh, and I think, yeah, these are 470 volt. So this one tested like 24.2, and the other one was like 29 point something. So both of these capacitors are good. So we'll put this back in. It's odd that they're different sizes, though. I think the kit on the online has them as a uh, is the same. So it's a little surprising. So I need to get another capacitor here because I only have one. I have, well, I have two 25s, not a 25 and a 30. There we go. Pop that back in there. Just like that. And again, I said it before, but pretty sure things didn't get captured. You always want to have a spare one of these, or in this case, two of these, because those capacitors, capacitors could stop working at any time. And a generator is kind of a, like a critical power device. So you want to have one ready to go of whatever size your generator needs. Not every generator is going to have the same size. So you got to Take yours apart if you do have a capacitor excited generator and see what you got. Normally you can just use air conditioning run capacitors. That's what I usually do. So this one, like I told you, I bought 25, 225s. These are just Titan HDs. I think these are made by Diversitech. You can buy these on Amazon or they're pretty good. This one's a 25 plus or minus five. So now we need to get a 30 plus or minus five. So I need a, one spare of each. And again, to test it, since I didn't show you that, let's yank this 25 out again. So you get your meter. Doesn't have to be a fluke meter. Put it on the microfarad setting. And just give her a good test across these terminals. Make sure you discharge it first with a screwdriver. This is 24.2 microfarads. This one is very, very, very much still good. If it was like 10 or five or something else, then it would be suspect. Now simply put everything back together the way you found it. So we got our 10 millimeter bolt that holds this cable clamp on. And we got our three other Phillips head screws. Two on the other side, not shown, and two over here. All right, folks, I think that's it for now. So uh, in this video, like I said, we changed the oil, we started the generator, we checked the waveform. Um, kind of realized it's a pretty good waveform for a portable generator that's not inverter. We installed an hour meter and we checked the capacitors on the, on the gen head. So. Hopefully you guys found this video helpful. If you did, please subscribe. Stay safe. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you can find one of these generators cheap, pick it up. It's a nice unit. Take care. Bye.